if you're a little bit confused about the rules of priority or right of way, you're not the only one, and it isn't your fault. Let's see if we can unconfuse you, because this is really a whole lot simpler than you've been led to believe. By the end of this video, I hope that you will find it completely demystified. Why do we even have rules of priority or right of way? Well, we have rules of priority for one reason and one reason only. The swords that we fence with are not sharp. If they were sharp, we wouldn't need any rules of priority. Blood would tell the tale. The wounds would be self-explanatory. The rules of priority were formulated to explain what would have happened if the swords had been sharp. These rules were formulated by people who were intimately familiar with swords for the benefit of people who were not. What is priority? Many people use the term right of way. We don't. I think that's a terrible translation. It has connotations that are very misleading. So we use the term priority. To me, right of way sounds too much like traffic regulations uh, that are arbitrary and capricious. You know, there are some places where you drive on the right-hand side of the road, and there are other places where you drive on the left-hand side of the road. But there's nothing inherently good or evil about either one of those things. It's just that people in that place got together and decided, okay, we'll drive on the right side or we'll drive on the left side. They could just as easily and just have reasonably decided the opposite. So right of way sounds to me like an artificial construct that somebody just made up ex recto. That's definitely not what priority is. Priority is an entirely different story. It's not arbitrary. It's not capricious. It's based on natural law and objective reality. It's not a rule that somebody made up. It's a reality that somebody observed. All you have to do is ask yourself, what if they were sharp? If I want to optimize my chances of survival and minimize my chances of being wounded, what should I do? That'll give you the right answer every time, if you understand the self-defense reflex. The self-defense reflex, aka the flinch reflex, or the startle reflex, it's instinctive, it's immediate, and it's powerful. It does two things. It makes you move away from present pain and it makes you avoid future pain. Ever step your bare foot on a Lego or a nail or a piece of glass, or something else really sharp? What did you do? Did you withdraw your foot from that thing faster than Bruce Lee? How long did you have to think about it before you did that? See, that's the self-defense reflex moving you away from present pain. Ever have something come at your face real fast all of a sudden? Did you blink? Did you duck? Did you put up your hands? That's your self-defense reflex trying to protect you from future pain. Now, how does the self-defense reflex apply in fencing? Well, two ways. First, a person who sees that he's about to get stabbed is not going to fail to try to do something about it, try to avoid it. And second, at the very instant that your opponent's sharp point begins to penetrate your body, all of your voluntary forward movement will cease. We sometimes use the term stop hit. A stop hit is a hit that stops 
your opponent from initiating any voluntary forward movement. However, a stop hit will not stop your opponent from completing a movement that has already begun once momentum has taken over. Consider what the word priority means. It can mean first in importance, as in, gee, honey, you know you're my top priority. <laughs> or it can mean first in time, like, I'm sorry, I have a prior commitment. In fencing, the word priority means both of those things, first in time and first in importance. Let's suppose that your opponent extends his arm, aims his point at your chest. That's a threat to your life. At that moment, the most important thing to you is not getting stabbed. We could say that's your priority. Further, your opponent has made this threat to your life before you did anything. Therefore, it happened prior to anything you do. It has the priority. We say it has the priority, but what we really mean is it is your priority. If you want to optimize your chances of survival, you have to minimize your chances of being wounded. You must not allow your opponent to stab you. <laughs> Not no way, not no time, not no how. And you only stab your opponent if, and only if, you can do it without getting stabbed yourself. Remember, we call fencing the art and science of touching without being touched. How long does priority last? Well, that depends. It lasts only as long as the threat lasts. Let me give you an example. We're standing on guard, minding our own business, <laughs> and suddenly you make a thrust and aim your weapon at my chest. You extend your arm out, make a threat to my life. My priority is not to get stabbed. You could say that the threat that exists now is my priority. And since you are the one holding the weapon. You have the priority. I'm focused on you because you're the threat. You're making the threat. So you have the priority. Now, when does that end? I beat your blade and send your point over there toward the left field bleachers. Now, there's no longer a threat to me. As soon as you're no longer aiming at my body, your priority is over. Threat's gone. Now, suppose while you're aiming, you know, over at those folks, I make a thrust and aim at your chest and present a threat to your life. See, now I'm your priority. I have the priority, right? You follow? Because now my threat exists and yours doesn't. You come back, beat my blade aside. As soon as I'm not aiming at you anymore, that threat is over. No more, no more priority there. You make a thrust again. Whew, another threat against my life. You've got the priority again. Right? You see how that goes? So who has the priority is what threat is extant at the moment? That threat has the priority, regardless of who is doing it. It's not so much that the person has priority. It's the thing he's doing establishes a present threat. That's what has the priority. Let's go over each of the rules of priority one by one. For this part, Let's imagine that you're going to fight a duel and you can't get out of it. And you come to me 
for advice on how you can optimize your chances of survival and minimize your chances of being wounded. There's all kinds of shit that can happen in a duel, all kinds of things. Golly, you say, what if my opponent does this? What, if, what should I do? What if my opponent does that? What should I do? How do I come out of this alive? Well, here's the advice I'm going to give you. One, one proviso before we go too far. Um, a duel is a, uh, is a mutually engaged combat. It's a fair fight between social equals. Uh, a duel is not a street fight. It's not a brawl. It's not an ambush. It's not a murder. For our purposes, we're going to assume that both combatants are of sound mind. That is, they both want to optimize their chances of survival, and they want to minimize their chances of being wounded. Now, the rules of priority may not apply or may not apply in the same way if your opponent is psychotic. That's someone who's completely divorced from reality. You aim a gun at them and what they see is a unicorn ho holding a candy cane. It may not apply the same way if the person is incompetent, that is, a person who lacks the mental capacity to understand what's happening. They may not apply against an opponent who is suicidal and who wants you to kill them. And they may not apply in the same way to someone who is committed. That is, someone who cares more about taking your life than he does about protecting his own. Okay, here we go. Yahoo! Number one, every correctly executed attack must be parried or avoided before the attacked fencer can make an offensive action of his own. That rule says that if you're attacked, you defend yourself. Don't just stand there like a dummy and let the other guy stab you. I hope that makes sense to you and requires no further explanation. You can remove the attack from the target, or you can remove the target from the attack. You can get out of the way, or you can parry. But you got to do something. See, once you launch your lunge at me, if I just thrust, even if I kill you stone cold dead during the flight of your lunge, it's not going to stop that lunge. Momentum has taken over. You may stab me after you die. That doesn't help me any. Therefore, if you're attacked, avoid it or parry it, period. Number two, we just talked about every correctly executed attack must be parried or avoided. Number two says, the attack is correctly executed when it is the initial offensive action made by fully and completely extending the sword arm, more or less horizontally, and continuously and progressively threatening the opponent's target. This rule says that if you're going to attack, you better do it right. You better attack in such a way that you trigger your opponent's self-defense reflex so that he will defend himself instead of trying to stab you. If you move your body toward my blade, that's not a threat to me. It's only a threat to me if you're moving your blade toward my body. So, when you make the attack, you extend your arm first, completely before you initiate your lunge. That is, your arm is extended, not just extending. One of my students said, but, but if I extend my arm first, won't my opponent see that coming? And I said, yeah, I hope so, because that's what's going to trigger his self-defense reflex and make him parry or avoid your attack rather than trying to stab you. 
Number three. Now this one sounds like it was written by a lawyer. When two hits arrive at the same time, there's either a simultaneous action or a double touch. A simultaneous action occurs when the fencers conceive and execute an attack at the same time. In this case, the touches, are given, uh, the touches given are annulled for both fencers, even if one of them has touched off target. However, a double touch is the result of a faulty action on the part of one of the fencers. The president must decide which fencer failed to effectively defend himself. The fencer who most at fault is counted as touched. If they are equally at fault, no touch is awarded. Well, there's a mouthful. What does that mean? Simultaneous action. Two fencers, independently of each other, conceive of and execute an attack at exactly the same moment. In my experience, this happens about as frequently as two lightning bolts independently, simultaneously hitting the same tree. It's not impossible. I have seen it happen. However, most of the time, it is not a simultaneous action. One fencer is reacting to the other. Most of the time, it's not simultaneous. It's a double touch, meaning that somebody made a mistake. Now, the fencer most at fault is counted as touched. How do you decide who's most at fault? Funny you should ask. There are, there are two really serious errors you can make here. The first error is allowing yourself to be stabbed by your opponent. That is voluntarily allowing your opponent to stab you. That's a serious error. There's only one error worse than that, and that is throwing yourself onto your opponent's point. In other words, you stab yourself for him. You do all the work. Isn't that nice of you? So when you look at who's at fault, look at who allowed himself to be stabbed or who threw himself onto the other guy's point. The guy who throws himself onto the other guy's point is always the one who's most at fault. Just a little tip. Now let's look at some specific circumstances. If your opponent attacks, that is, if you're the defender, under what circumstances are you counted as touched? Well, it says, the defender is counted as touched if he makes a stop hit against a simple attack. Well, I think we've already discussed that. Your opponent attacks you and you just let him stab you and you try and stab him back. That's a mistake because you're allowing your opponent to stab you. Remember those two errors we talked about? Okay. The defender is counted as touched if instead of parrying, he attempts to avoid being touched and fails. Okay, you tried to get out of the way, but you blew it. You got stabbed. Or three, if you attempt to parry and your parry fails. You tried to do the right thing, but you didn't do it well enough and you got hit anyway. Stabbed is stabbed. The defender is counted as touched if, after a successful parry, he delays his repost. If you delay your repost, you're letting your opponent stab you. See how this works? The defender is counted as touched if, against a compound attack, he makes a stop hit without having the advantage of a period of fencing time. Well, this is basically the same thing as making a stop hit against a simple attack, except it's preceded by a bunch of feints. It doesn't change anything in the final action. You're letting your opponent stab you. For your stop hit to work against your opponent's compound attack, remember, you have to stab him before he initiates a voluntary action forward. 
Once he initiates that action, momentum takes over. Your stop hit is only in time against a compound attack when it prevents that final action from happening. Number six, the defender is counted as touched if, being in line, he replaces his blade in line or attacks instead of parrying after his opponent deflects the blade and makes a direct thrust. So this has two parts. You're in line, your opponent beats your blade out of the way and attacks you, and instead of parrying, you just try and stab from back. So in this case, the error is you're allowing your opponent to stab you. In the second case, he beats your blade out of line, puts his point in line, and you bring your blade back into line and attack and lunge onto your opponent's blade. You're throwing yourself onto your opponent's point. That's an even worse mistake. Now, what if you're the attacker? Then what? The attacker is counted as touched if, number one, he starts his attack when the opponent is in line without first deflecting the opposing blade. You follow? Your opponent's in line, and you just attack. The touch is against you because you're throwing yourself onto your opponent's point. Number two, the attacker is counted as touched if he attempts to find the blade and fails and continues his attack. You're touched because you're throwing yourself onto your opponent's point. The attacker is counted as touched if during a compound attack, his opponent finds the blade and he continues the attack while the opponent makes an immediate riposte. The touch is against the attacker because he's throwing himself onto his opponent's riposte. Number four, the attacker is counted as touched if, during a compound attack, he hesitates for a moment during which the opponent delivers a stop thrust and he continues his attack. You are touched because you're throwing yourself onto your opponent's point. Number five, the attacker is counted as touched if, in a compound attack, he receives a stop hit that touches before he commences the final movement of his attack. Now in this case, if the swords had been sharp, the stop hit would have prevented the final movement of the attack from ever happening. Number six, the attacker is counted as touched if he makes a remise, redoublement, or reprise during his opponent's immediate simple riposte. Well, these are all basically the same thing. A remise, redoublement, or reprise are variations of continuing the attack. If you continue your attack, after your opponent parries and is making a riposte, well, guess what? You're throwing yourself onto your opponent's riposte. So, what does all that mean? Well, first, don't allow your opponent to stab you. Second, don't throw yourself onto your opponent's point. Remember those two things. In practice, it means this. The point in line has priority over the attack. The attack has priority over the counterattack. The immediate riposte has priority over the remise. The remise has priority over the delayed riposte. And the stop hit has priority if it arrives before the opponent's final action begins. Let me see if I can simplify it even further. Here's what I refer to as Logan's Laws, after my first teacher, Mr. David Logan. Here's Logan's Laws. Number one, when there is blade contact by your opponent's volition, defend. Number two, 
when there is blade contact by your volition, attack. Number three, when there is absence by your opponent's volition, defend. Number four, when there is absence by your volition, attack. I hope you begin to see that the rules of priority are simple and natural and make perfect sense. But you know what? If you follow the five tactical principles, if you never attack without having control of your opponent's blade, and if you always make opposition in the final line, you won't be hit. And that has priority over everything.